Hello, hello, and welcome back to the quantum computer simulator I made in Scratch. If you haven't seen my previous YouTube video demoing it, you should go back and check that out now. In this video, I'm going to show you some of the mathematics of quantum computing, and we'll find out just how those demos worked. So here we are back in the Scratch quantum computer simulator, and you might notice I've changed the names of some of the instructions. Hopefully they're a bit more intuitive now. Also, as you can see from these little demos I'm running, I've changed it so that the values qubits have are called false and true rather than zero and one. Okay, in this video, we're gonna analyze four quantum computer programs, starting with the first one that you see on screen here. This simple program makes a thing or qubit called my qubit, and then does the mysterious hat instruction and finally prints out the result. As you remember from the last video, or as you just watch me run it now, the result of this program is to just output false or true with equal probability, 50-50. So our first piece of analysis is going to be to understand why this happens. So we have these three lines of quantum code using one qubit called my qubit. And we know my qubit can take on the values false, f, or true, t. We also know there's randomness involved in quantum computing. So you might think that as we go through the code, there's always some probability that my qubit is false and some probability that my qubit is true. But that's not exactly right. Instead, there's always a quote unquote amplitude of my qubit being false and an amplitude of my qubit being true. These amplitudes act somewhat like probabilities, but they're a little bit weirder as we're gonna see. Now the default is that when you first make or initialize a qubit, all one of its amplitude is on false. So when we first execute this line of code, we get into this state that the amplitude of my qubit being false is one, and the amplitude of it being true is zero. And if hypothetically we just printed my qubit now, we would always see false. But we don't do that. The next thing we do is this magical quantum instruction that I fancifully call hat. Now, the real name of hat is Hadamard transform. Or you can also think of it as standing for Hadamard all the things, because what it really does is apply the special Hadamard operation to each qubit. Now we only have one qubit here, my qubit, so we're just gonna apply Hadamard to this single qubit. And what does the Hadamard instruction do? Well, it affects the amplitudes with which my qubit is false or true. More precisely, the amplitude on false changes to the sum of the two amplitudes my qubit has, and the amplitude on true changes to the difference of the two amplitudes that my qubit has. So let's see this in action. Currently, the two amplitudes of my qubit are one and zero. Their sum, one plus zero, is one, so that's gonna be the new amplitude on false. And their difference, one minus zero, is one, and that's gonna be the new amplitude on true. So, after we do this hat, or Hadamard instruction, the new state of affairs is that there's amplitude one on my qubit being false, and also amplitude one on my qubit being true. Some people like to say that my qubit is in a superposition with equal amplitude on false and on true. Okay, so the last line of code will be to print our qubit, or to measure it according to the usual name in quantum computing. And what is the rule for measuring or printing? The rule is that we display each possibility with probability proportional to the square of the amplitude. That's a bit of a mouthful, so let's take a closer look. First, we take a look at the amplitudes and we square them. The amplitude on false is one, and the square of that is one. And the amplitude on true is also one, and the square of that is also one. So we have equal squared amplitudes, and that means when we print out my qubit, we see the two possibilities with equal probability. So this finally explains the behavior of this code that we saw back in Scratch. Every time you run it, there's an equal chance that it'll display false or that it will display true. Okay, so let's go back to Scratch and we'll take the program we had and insert one more new block, one more instruction. It'll be the toggle instruction. We're gonna toggle my qubit just after we've created it. So the effect of that will be that my qubit will become true right before we get to the hat instruction. So if we now try running this code, you'll see that sometimes we output true and sometimes we output false, just like with the previous version of the code. And in fact, if you run it a bunch of times, you'll empirically find that again, there's a 50% chance of outputting true and a 50% chance of outputting false, just like before. So let's go and do an analysis of this code to see why once again, we get a 50-50 chance of outputting true or false. Okay, here's that code we're gonna analyze. So the first line initializes my qubit, which puts us into a state where all one of the amplitude is on false. 
The next line toggles my qubit, which has the effect of switching false and true. So now my qubit has one amplitude of being true and zero amplitude of being false. I like to list the amplitudes with false coming before true, so let's just switch these two lines around. Now we come to the Hadamard instruction, so let's remember how it works. We replace the amplitude on false with the sum of the two amplitudes, and we replace the amplitude on true with the difference of the two amplitudes. The sum is 0 plus 1, which is 1, and the difference is 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. So after this Hadamard instruction, the new state is that we have amplitude 1 of my qubit being false, and amplitude negative 1 of my qubit being true. Sounds weird, but that's the way it works. Finally, we come to the print, or measuring, instruction. Remember that this instruction works by displaying each value with probability proportional to the square of its amplitude. 1 squared is 1, and negative 1 squared is also 1. So again, false and true have equal squared amplitudes, they're both 1. Therefore, false and true are displayed with equal probability, 50-50, just like in the previous version of the code without the toggle instruction. I want to show you one more variant of this code. You might remember it from the previous video where I made an analogy with the double slit experiment. In this new version, we're going to take out the toggle instruction and replace it with another Hadamard instruction. So the new version of the code will make my qubit, then it'll do a Hadamard instruction, then it'll do another Hadamard instruction, and then it will print out the qubit. Now as you can see, when we run this new version of the code, it prints false every time. Every time we run this code, it prints false. And that's despite the fact that when we only had one Hadamard instruction in this code, it was 50-50 whether it printed false or true. So let's do the analysis of this code. Just as before, when we first make my qubit, we have all one of the amplitude on false. Then we come to the first Hadamard instruction. Once again, this replaces the amplitude on false with the sum of the two amplitudes, and replaces the amplitude on true with the difference of the two amplitudes. So the sum is 1 plus 0, which is 1, and the difference is 1 minus 0, which is also 1. So after the first Hadamard instruction, we have one amplitude on false and one amplitude on true. This is just like in the first version of the code that we analyzed, where we immediately printed and saw the 50-50 chance of seeing true or false. But now we're going to do the second Hadamard instruction. The operation is just like before. So the new amplitude on false will be 1 plus 1, and the new amplitude on true will be 1 minus 1. In other words, after the second Hadamard instruction, we have amplitude 2 on false and amplitude 0 on true. By the way, this effect where two amplitudes get subtracted leaving 0 is sometimes called interference. In any case, we now come to the print instruction or measurement instruction, and once again, each value is displayed with probability proportional to the square of its amplitude. So let's look at the squared amplitudes. 2 squared is 4, and 0 squared is 0. So now all the squared amplitude is on false, which means there's a 100% probability of displaying my qubit equals false, just like we saw in the scratch quantum computer. By the way, as a side note, I just wanted to mention how this one quantum instruction, Hadamard, got its name. Here once more is how the Hadamard instruction works. If you have amplitudes x and y on false and true, then after Hadamarding, the new amplitudes are x plus y on false and x minus y on true. Now if you've ever studied linear algebra before, you might recognize that this transformation, which maps the two numbers x and y into the two numbers x plus y and x minus y, can be represented with a matrix multiplication. Specifically, if we stack the two old amplitudes x and y into a two-dimensional vector, and we stack the new amplitudes x plus y and x minus y into a two-dimensional vector, then the transformation of the Hadamard instruction is just multiplication by the matrix you see on the left with entries 1, 1, 1, and minus 1. And this little matrix was studied a long time ago by this guy, Jacques Hadamard, who also proved the prime number theorem. The last quantum program I want to analyze is the finale from the previous video, usually called the bernstein vazirani algorithm. To remind you about that program, it starts by assuming you created some number of qubits, like six of them, plus one more qubit called ants. Now over on the right there is a subroutine called mystery toggles, which is supposed to do a bunch of if m then toggle ants instructions. It can contain any subset of the six possible instructions, maybe with m1, m2, m4 or something, but let me restore it to m1, m3, m4, and m5. Okay, so that's mystery toggles, and in this case there are 64 different possibilities for what it might contain. Now this quantum code called toggles detective only makes a single call to the mystery toggles subroutine, 
but when you run it, it amazingly determines the exact contents of mystery toggles. You see, the first, third, fourth, and fifth outputs are T for true, which corresponds to the mystery toggles based on M1, M3, M4, and M5. Again, check out the previous video if you want a proper demo. In this video, I'll show you the behind the scenes of how this quantum code works. Okay, let's take a look at the toggles detective code. For the purposes of this explanation, we're going to assume we just have two M variables, plus ants of course. I know it's more impressive when there are six of them rather than two, but it'll make our lives simpler. So with three total qubits, there are eight possibilities for their values. False, 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 true, false, true, false, etc. And the order in which we list the falses and trues will always be M1, then M2, then ants. As we step through the code, each of the eight possibilities will have some amplitude. The initial value of all the qubits is false, so at the beginning, all one of the amplitude is on the possibility false, 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 with the remaining seven possibilities having amplitude zero. Now, rather than having this long column of amplitudes, I prefer to depict the amplitudes on the corners of a cube. We have a 3D cube because there are three qubits. Each of the three qubits is associated with a direction, so M1 is up and down, M2 is left and right, and M3 is in and out. So you can see among the eight possible settings, all the ones that have M1 equals false are on the top, and all the ones with M1 equals true are on the bottom. The ones where M2 is false are on the left, and the ones where M2 is true are on the right, and the ones where ants is false are at the front, and the ones where ants is true are at the back. So again, initially we have one amplitude on false, 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 and the seven other possibilities all have zero amplitude. Now this is all the amplitudes at the start of Toggle's detective. Okay, let's move to the first line of code, which is toggle ants. So that just means the third qubit, the ants qubit, switches its value between true and false. So all the values on the front face switch to true, and all the values on the back face switch to false. In particular, the current state of the qubits is that there's one amplitude on false, false, true. Now, that's all that happens when we do the toggle ants command, but I want to redraw the picture of the amplitudes right now to clean things up. I always want the eight bit strings in their original positions at the corners of the cube. So let's switch the labels back to where they were, and of course also switch the amplitudes along with them. Note that this switching hasn't changed the state at all. We've just redrawn the picture, and we still have one amplitude on false, false, true, and zero amplitude on all the other possibilities. Moving on, we come to the hat instruction, or hatamard transform, or hatamard all the things. This is really just shorthand for doing Hadamard on each of the three qubits. So Hadamard M1, Hadamard M2, Hadamard ants. So the first instruction we have to understand is Hadamard on M1. Remember, M1 is the up and down direction. So let's pair up all the corners of the cube in this way. So this up and down edge on the far left, for example, represents the world where M2 and ants are both false, and the only thing varying is whether M1 is false or true. Now remember the way Hadamard works is that you replace the two amplitudes with the sum and the difference. And in particular, you put the sum of the two amplitudes on false and the difference of the two amplitudes on true. So we need to do this operation on each of the four up and down edges in this picture. Most of the edges have both amplitudes equal to zero. So the sum is zero and the difference is zero and nothing happens. But that back left edge has its top amplitude equal to one and bottom amplitude equal to zero. So the sum is one plus zero, which is one, and the difference is one minus zero, which is also one. So the effect of this Hadamard instruction is to change those two values to one and one. Okay, now we move on to the next Hadamard instruction, Hadamard on M2. M2 is the horizontal direction, so we pair up the corners of the cube in this way. That back top edge, for example, represents the world where M1 is false and ants is true, and we have the two possibilities for M2, false and true. Again, when we do the Hadamard instruction, we put the sum of the amplitudes on the false part and the difference of the amplitudes on the true part. So on that back top edge, the sum is one, the difference is also one, so it will change to one, one. The back bottom edge looks the same, so it will also change to one and one. The two front edges are both zero, zero, so they just stay as zero, zero. Finally, we come to the Hadamard ants instruction, the ants direction is in and out, so we again pair up the edges in this direction. Now notice that all the edges have zero amplitude on the front side, the false side, and one amplitude on the back side, the true side. 
the sum of zero and one is one, and the difference of zero and one is negative one. So after this Hadamard ants instruction, all the amplitudes on the front face become one, and all the amplitudes on the back face become minus one. Okay, that's it for Hadamarding all the things. The effect of the code so far is to get into the state where we have amplitude one on all the possibilities where ants is false, and amplitude negative one on all the possibilities where ants is true. Now we come to the mystery toggles step. Now we only have two m variables here rather than the six in our demo, so there are only four possibilities for what mystery toggles can be. The one I chose is just to have if m2 then toggle ants. I'll show how this one goes, and I leave it to you to work out the other three possibilities. Having no instructions in there, having just if m1 then toggle ants, and finally having both if m1 then toggle ants and if m2 then toggle ants. Okay, so let's tackle this if m2 then toggle ants instruction. This instruction only involves m2 and ants. It doesn't involve m1. So I faded out a little the first false or true in each of the eight labels, the one corresponding to m1. So the way this instruction works is you look at m2's value, which is either true or false. And if it's true, then you toggle ants' value between false and true. Now the settings where m2 is true are all those on the rightmost face. So when we do this instruction, all the settings on the rightmost face get their third value, the one corresponding to ants, toggled. You can see this in magenta. Now, for example, if you look at the top right corner of the diagram, you see we have negative one amplitude on false, true, false. But with this change, we've got our labels in the wrong positions again. We need to restore the labels to their right positions and bring the amplitudes along with them. Okay, and that's actually it for the mystery toggle subroutine. Effectively, we swap the back right vertical edge with the front right vertical edge. This is a good time for you to think about what would happen if we also had the if m1 then toggle ants instruction here inside mystery toggles. And if we did, whether or not it would make a difference what order we did the instructions in. Anyway, let's move along, popping back up to the toggles detective code where we encounter the second hat instruction. Remember, this just corresponds to doing Hadamard on M1, M2, and ants, so let's expand that out again. And we'll go through these one by one, starting with Hadamard M1. Again, we pair up the labels in the M1, or up and down direction, and we do the Hadamard operation on each pair. These pairs have amplitudes 1, 1, or negative 1, negative 1. In both cases, the difference is 0, and the sum is either 2 or negative 2. So after this Hadamard M1 instruction, all the amplitudes on the bottom face become zero, and the ones on the top face will be either two or negative two. Moving on to the Hadamard M2 instruction, we pair up all the corners in the horizontal direction. The edges on the bottom face are all zero, so they just stay all zeros. And as for the edges on the top face, well, they both have sum equal to zero, so we'll get zeros on the left corners, and the differences are negative four and positive four. Finally, we have Hadamard on ants, so we pair up the labels in the in and out direction, and only one edge has something interesting going on. That top right edge has a sum of zero and a difference of four minus negative four, which is eight. So finally, after these Hadamards, we end up in a very simple state. We have amplitude eight on false, true, true, and amplitude zero on all the other seven possibilities. So finally we come to the print instruction, where the rule is that each possibility is displayed with probability proportional to the square of the amplitude. But all the squared amplitudes are just zero, except for the squared amplitude on false true true, which is 64. Which means that false true true is displayed with all of the probability. And ta-da! That's exactly revealing what's in mystery toggles. Remember, ants always comes out true. But the other two values, the false and true, that correspond to M1 and M2, reveal that M2 is inside mystery toggles, and M1 is not inside mystery toggles. Okay, well, that's it for our under-the-hood look at the detective toggles, or Bernstein-Vazirani algorithm. If you've made it this far in the video, congratulations. You might want to try the analysis yourself for other versions of mystery toggles, maybe even with one more qubit, although then you'll have to draw a four-dimensional hypercube. Or you might just want to head over to Scratch and play around with the quantum computer simulator yourself. Have fun! Bye!